us to the cloud, everybody, and welcome to the cloud. You didn't know you're in the cloud, but you are officially in the cloud. And in the cloud with us is IU, Indiana University, right here. I'm wearing it for a second because, because Indiana University women's basketball is number two in the country All today. Right. Congrats. For the first time ever, and could move up to number one by the end of the week if we win our game and South Carolina loses their game. Nice. But, you know, uh, it probably isn't going to happen, but at least we made it up to, to number two in the country for the first time ever. I and am I a basketball fan. Okay, so UConn is on the East Coast. They always win it. Yeah, you know, they so. do, yeah. So, you know, um, so tonight, the topic of tonight uh, for for what it, what it's worth is behaviorism in the schedule. But we don't have to talk uh -huh. about behaviorism too much because after break, I will be talking about behaviorism and and the derivations thereof. And there are many and there are many. And as I mentioned before, I worked with B.F. Skinner's daughter and son-in-law wow. when I was at West Virginia. And I got to meet B.F. Skinner on the phone briefly before he passed okay. away, right wow. before he passed away. So, um, so Renee Hung is a learning designer at Brandeis, but in her spare time, for fun, just for, for kicks, she's working <laughs> on a dissertation with me and analyzing all sorts of collaborative team data and like getting her second and third master's degrees along the way of getting a PhD. So you know, just a little, couple of little things like that, but she's in our literacy, culture and language education, which was a department. Now it's a program within curriculum and instruction. Mm. Which she's also working with um, TESOL program, teachers of English, mm. second language and, and IST. She's an IST master's student as well. So, um, and, and I think Chinese pedagogy and whatnot, what else? So um, she went to the University of Pennsylvania for a master's in TESOL and has been working at, in Bloomington for a number of years, as well as at IUPUI, designing courses up there for the medical school. She worked in their center, global center. Um, what, is that, what is that called officially? International Global Education? What's the title of that building? The it's Global Rose. Center of International Study. Yeah, Global Center for International Studies, which is pretty well known. Only Indiana, I think Georgetown or Maryland have the big programs in global education. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the big ones. And we all, they brought them all together, in all the different units for African-American studies and East Asian studies and all that in one building and had um, the uh, Secretary of, uh, of State uh, christen that a bit and gave a speech at that. Um, who ran for president back in 90, who was that? John Kerry for opening yeah. the building up. So that was yeah. kind of neat. So John McCormick is the associate director of learning design at Brandeis University. And his background is with a master's at University of Washington, really great place and a lovely place to live. I'm sure it was, it was a very pretty place um, in educational communications and technology. And the past 18 years has worked in the, in the areas of man, uh, managing online and distance learning, uh, including at North Shore Community College. Well, you've got this in, in you, I, I've sent you all, all this. And he's um, in particular interested in peer feedback models and using learning analytics to improve the personalization of the learning environments. I think um, Renee has some of those same kind of interests and really they're interested in improving the online pedagogy through, through the use in, of thoughtful use uh, and integration of technologies in education, whether it's an online or blended or just a technology enhanced face-to-face -face classroom. So really the, the ball game is ours, the whole ball game, because we can cover A to Z tonight if we want to. We have many questions that, that have been vetted three or four times um, Christian, actually, so if we could, we could throw a, a softball question to you, uh, I could, I could say, hey, Christian, um, why don't you throw in one of your questions from your list that they don't know is coming? That might be a nice way to start. So Christian's my assistant; he's my TA, and he sent me hey, all these questions uh, right when I was forming these with with John and with Renee. And so um, let's throw in one that they don't haven't heard. So pick pick one off your list, Christian, and go ahead and ask it. And you only get 10 okay. seconds to decide. You only get 10 <laughs> seconds. Okay. So, Renee, uh, <laughs> with your interest in, yeah, with interest in your language instruction, uh, what are the most useful and commonly used tools for design and development of instructional intervention? In language education, the you mean technology tool? Yeah. 
Yeah. Hmm. Um, to be honest, um, my language, like my experience with language classes, um, one part is with teaching Chinese um, to speakers, like um, American students mostly. Um, and when I was teaching, it was face-to-face. -face, um, so we didn't actually use the technology tool, um, but we did use one thing that's called Padlet. Um, maybe some of you have used that for collaborative learning um, and we use that for students to share their um, presentation like oral presentation they record it in Mandarin Chinese and then um, they share feedback on Padlet and I, I personally like Padlet because it's really flexible in sharing resources and you can share text you can share video you can share comments um, you can move things around um, as long as everyone log in you know who moved that around um, but yeah, that was probably the only thing we we use. Uh, it was optional for the student if they want to share because they are doing in person, like um, in class presentation. That was like an alternative way for them to get feedback. So, okay, but that was I'll pretty stop fun. You there, uh, and I'll go to John. Um, mm -hmm. What instructional design development mm, is popular at Brandeis within your unit? Uh, instructional design practices, norms, expectations. And do you have anything on the web or any supply, anything you want to show us that might exemplify that or or not? Yeah, maybe uh, Renee and I talked about that. So the, the expectations at Brandeis, they, they to them, instructional design, learning design is somewhat new. They've always had a group of um, an online school, which is basically the extension school. And they're kind of like the poor cousin at Brandeis, you know, they don't know what to do with them, but they make money for the university. And we, our team before Renee came used to work just for them. And then we were centralized in the Center for Teaching and Learning. So the experience of the campus, the face-to-face -face campus is, oh, I used to work with a learning designer once that, you know, the RAB school, this, you know, graduate professional school let us borrow and it was a great experience. So they don't really know much about uh, instructional design. So the practices and norms are, first of all, large, somewhat inherited from the time I took over the small team. And then we've updated that with our team. So we have a design process that I could talk about it, but uh, I'm, I don't want to go into much detail until you have a follow up or something that I can help with specifically. Yeah. So I'll ask both of you this question. The next one, you know, what are your current job responsibilities and the associated competencies and skills that are associated with that? And I'll also mention a few people who came in a couple of minutes late. I am wearing my honorary IU shirt for one more minute. I'm going to take this off, put my suit on because IU women's basketball is ranked number two in the country as of today for the first time ever. Bo's kind of sad. He's up at Purdue land. You know, we beat his Boilermakers yesterday or Sunday or whenever it was in men's basketball. Uh, but, um, but yeah, men and women are doing good in particular the women's team has won like a umpty nine games in a row, uh, maybe 11 or 12 or something like that. So for another minute, I wear my IU and I'll throw the IU up here. Um, so, so competencies and skills, um, what, what are your current responsibilities? What, what do they, what do my students have to look forward to in the future? Renee, you want to start? You want me to? Oh, I can, I can start. Um, I found learning theories useful, learning theories, um, adult learning theory, and then um, I would say communication skills are important, um, project management skill, um, and teaching experience. Um, it, I, I personally found it useful. Um, it's probably not required as a learning designer, but uh, I found it really useful when working with faculty. Um, I guess I'll jump in. So. This reminded me that, um, Kurt, when we hired Renee, I had a document I had shared of criteria for hiring. And I had to create this because we had a person on the team who was a librarian uh, and they had to be on the team and they just didn't know our field, right? So I have a list, and but I could share this document as well at some point if anyone's interested. It's like one page or so. Uh, so the list is um, interpersonal skills, communication, listening, those things together really important because we we have a coaching model, right? We we actually coach instructors, faculty to do learning design. We just don't talk about it and use jargon, right? We try to surface their, their uh, teaching style and what they're doing currently so we can move them to a little bit better place. Then teaching skills is helpful given that we work here. And when you start doing this job, I remember almost 20 years ago, the first time I met people, 
I thought, boy, if I hadn't taught, I did teach for eight or nine years as an English as a second language instructor at, uh, in community colleges. Um, so they ask a lot of questions that without on the ground experience would be a little bit challenging at times to answer. Then I have learning design, learning science, understanding how people learn, coaching, if possible, that'd be great, project management. And then there's these, like these non-skill attributes, you know, being supportive, flexible, open-minded, dependable, generous in collaboration, that kind of thing. So you kind of stole my next question. I'm sorry. Was, no, no, that's great. Because, you know, I was going to ask what, what skills you look for in the point from the point of a hiring manager, you know, and you just, you, just, you know, went through the list. So um, there's a few others. I said detail oriented, but you can kind of see a big picture or understand and then persuade without being pushy. So I'll ask both of you this next question in, you know, um, we're all interested in, in learner engagement. And by the way, Renee, I'm going to have, I'm going to talk about theory after the, you go, you go and we'll take a break. I'll, I'll, I'll be giving the fun version of behavioral theory uh, after break. So if there is a fun version, I'll be giving the fun version. I'll tie in uh, Harry Potter and um, a couple other TV shows in with behavioral theory. So um, what's that? Um, Big Bang Theory, yeah, Big Bang Theory <laughs> as well. So, um, <laughs> um, so, in, we're all interested in interactivity, engagement, and in, in boosting or elevating the quality of all our instruction, whatever the format, you know, and and whatever stripes we put on it. But in particular, engagement, which is a hard nut to define. I had a student once try to do a dissertation on engagement, and she gave up. Because she, yeah, yeah. Define, she ended up doing a close one. It was rather close looking at the online MBA program here. I don't know if you have an online MBA there, but I assume that you probably do at Brandeis. But may, may I'm wrong. I don't think so, they do, but they're trying to start one. Okay. So what what would you say if someone high up mucky muck, or if one of my students came to visit, what would you say are some things that you've done to boost engagement in the classes that you've helped design or redesign? Renee, is it Long me or you? Um, so overall, I would say giving options uh, is important for adult learners. Just in general, giving them options for assignments or options for how to process information or just what interests them or what makes sense to them. Because um, people maybe found different things. Um, some make sense, some they don't, but maybe it makes sense for some other people. Um, so I think that's just important for motivating adult learner and then to just like somehow fit that into their uh thought system i think um so yeah sorry i'm just looking at some of my notes uh yeah for online um what we say on campus you know the way they understand this is active learning techniques which is another sort of vague term right but i'd say this kind of list uh, knowing and integrating students interest showing the real world value of what they're learning um, trying to use authentic assessment, asking for feedback during the course and using that feedback to adjust your teaching, uh, showing presence, things like teaching presence. I use the community of inquiry model sometimes to teach the faculty how to approach their design and teach. Yeah, which is popular here as well. And um, yeah, I just got a publication related to social and teaching presence. In fact, it's a little complicated mm -hmm. one. It's not a lot, like a lessons learned kind of a thing. And in two weeks, we we're covering authentic learning in two weeks, by the way. So everyone, you know, hey. uh, take notes. Um, <laughs> uh, normally I bring my friend Tom Reeves from Georgia on that, but I brought him in so many times, I'm going to give him a break <laughs> and I'll try and do it from memory. But um, I, I'm going to ask a little different question than what's on the list here, John and Renee. Um, I, I got on here, how's your job changed uh, since you started? And I think that's an important question for John, but I'll ask it a little differently for Renee. And then how did the, your responsibilities change from what you were doing at IUPUI and the medical school? You might tell people what you're doing at IUPUI and, and, and how it's different there at Brandeis. But so um, but maybe maybe we'll go with John first. John, sure. has anything changed in what you're doing in your jobs in the nine years or so you've been there and in the people underneath you, the responsibilities that they have, how has that changed? Yeah, um, I've only been at Brandeis for about three years and okay. the previous job I was there for nine years. So if the Brandeis job, it's the most extreme in some ways change that I've had because when I started, I was, even though I had the same title, I didn't have learning designers under me. I worked for somebody else. And then I basically took over their job. 
after three months, they left, that person left. And we were at that school, the extension school, RAV, graduate professional school. And then I had an interim boss. And then I had another person who was a librarian be my supervisor when we integrated in the CTL. And that's the big change. We were integrated in the library, but the Center for Teaching and Learning had not been reformed yet. New to Brandeis in a way, even though it had sort of existed in some format. And then maybe six months ago, I had a fourth boss, supervisor. And so the big change for I think both of us is that we are starting to integrate ourselves into supporting face-to-face -face instructors, which some of it's very different, more like a faculty development position. So I'm really interested in melding the learning design and faculty development worlds, which are very different, right? They use different journals, they have different practices, but I think they could benefit from being together. Renee? Um, so for me, the transition from the IUPUI job to Brandeis, the biggest difference is uh, with IUPUI, I generally, uh, I, I, I didn't really design or redesign the whole course. Uh, usually the faculty identify one part of the course they wanted to improve and they came to us and then we chatted and then gave them options what we think might work to just uh, achieve their, their goal and then we go from there. Um, but with Brandeis, we actually did the whole course. So it's from from um, scoping and from uh, initiating the the collaboration, from to tracking, um, finish the whole thing. So the process is very, is very different. And then I think the responsibility over that process is also very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So basically, you are an instructional consultant at Brent at uh, IEPY, just help helping faculty with their questions and really an instructional designer role now more so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, I also built the part of the course they wanted to improve, say, if they want to improve a particular assessment, then we will work on that part. And I also build a module or build the assessment module, um, but it was not for the whole course. So we're getting through these questions quickly. So make sure that, uh, mm -hmm. Christian, you create a, a Padlet for us and put the link if you haven't put that up there, Christian. And I, I will also make I'll Christian a, a co-host. So in case anyone else sneaks in here um, when I don't detect them. So you are now a co-host, Christian. Um, so, you know, we kind of hinted at this question earlier, and I think you both passed on this one. Uh, or didn't answer it. Um, do you have a preferred instructional design model? And if not, that's okay, um, mm. because things are becoming very eclectic today. Or do you have people that you read that you would recommend that, or books that you've read or uh, that you would recommend to my students? Because I've given them a big reading list, but a lot of options. Mm. Maybe if you could pull out some things for them, that would be helpful. Uh, this is me or you, Renee? Either one, both, it's both. I, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I can start, Renee, but just jump in or interrupt, uh, yeah. or people can interrupt me. Uh, this is a tough question. So, uh, people I read, I, I like to show, I was talking to Renee about this. I've thought a lot about in academia until, I don't know, some years ago, five or 10 maybe, that you could read very little about how this was done on the ground in academia. What's learning design look like, right? And I know you, I'm sure, Kurt, you know, David Jonathan was the problem solving guru. Right. And he used to use this. Um, when I think about this, there's also another model I can mention. But if I can share the screen for a minute, I think we all do something like this. And in, in academia, it's the sort of simplest level of like the idea of design. So you can see that funnel. Yep. Yeah. So you, you start with, with faculty where you're in the coaching model and you're trying to find out like, what are your constraints? How long do you have? What's the budget? Um, you know, uh, what are they starting with? Um, what are their interests? But then there's the beliefs, right? Where they usually talk about this is the designer's beliefs, but I think it's also when we coach faculty, it's their beliefs. That's a real constraint as well. And you start out with a really broad, this is to me the most interesting part of the beginning of where you're trying to find out surface their pedagogy, find out where they're starting at and where you can maybe able to go. And then as you move down, it's just a series of decisions that continue to kind of constrain the problem into smaller and smaller pieces uh, till you get to sort of uh, different kind of model sketches, prototypes, right? So we kind of do this. And another model, I think that- uh, is, that is that Jonathan's? This is a Jonathan paper, but he keeps, he uses this. I had his original book on problem solving, 
you know, and I think he died in 2012, right? Right, so right. Designing problems for secondary students. But I was just thought, oh, that's great. He's saying we're a design science, like engineering, like architecture. And the architects doesn't build a home, but they design it, right? And so we try to explain sometimes using this analogy. Um, and for and my students, if you take Professor Bowling's class, she'll talk a lot about design in there. So do take her class if you're interested in that topic. I'll also point out, we almost hired David Jonathan about oh, really? 15, 20 years ago. He's a friend of mine, actually, was a friend oh. of mine and his wife, too. Uh, I visited him right before he passed away. I went to Missouri, actually. I was there for another reason, but uh -huh. yeah, uh, I've known him, knew him for a, a long time. Um, just a brilliant person. He's got an interesting history, if anyone wants, reads it. It does. And, yeah. and, and if you go to ACT Legends and Legacy videos, uh, and you're going to do that for one of your assignments, any of my students, He's, his is one of the videos that they, he's, he's one of the, one of the big names they interviewed about 20, 30, 40 people. And he's among the videos and one of the better ones, actually. So if oh, you're nice. doing that assignment option, I recommend David Jonathan. So I'm glad you pulled that out and he's in our reading list. So oh, David yeah. Jonathan would be good to read. <laughs> so I don't want to go on to any line, but I was walking by my bookcase thinking about my chat with Renee and I said, oh, this, this book I have about successful approximation model, it's kind of like, you know, about the simplest version. If you go beyond that funnel diagram right of where we are and uh so i think in the real world you you pick a model you mix models right i have a lot of things i've read i'm a inveterate reader of things but i also really enjoyed reading about and still use with faculty and design like the idea of expert novice you know research early on it really helps faculty sort of understand the difference between you know the blindness of expertise that kind of thing um, but I could go on for a long time about this, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, they, another student might have a question, then we can come back to it, if if if, if so. Sure. So, yeah, that's a that's a nice, si a, a good answer for at this point. Renee, do you have anything I to add, add to that? Um, I can add, I think um, backward design has been useful uh, for the projects I work on, um, especially like some project has, the, the course has a final project, and then that's a really guiding principle for us to, for the rest of the um, course assignment or discussion. And I personally also, I think the design thinking process um, has helped me with like how to approach with faculty um, communication or, you know, establish like the understanding um, between me and the client. So I think the design thinking process, part of that, um, it guides my own process, like on my end, but not really a pro like a a model I will brought, brought up with with them, but backward design, uh, we actually sometimes would explicitly uh, mention that to the instructor so they understand where we are going. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll also mention, I, I have an article in the last year or two with, with two former students who Renee knows with Merve uh, Bazdega and, and Mena Ju on design thinking in our School of Public Health. They're, they're, we're training undergrads to become instructional designers actually. So I only have two more of the general questions. I have three more specific for each of you. I'm going to stop after these next two and let the students ask some questions. And I might go back to the three specific for you near the end. So the, the last two, I'm going to combine number eight and nine together and then number 10 individually. Number eight has to do with what new and innovative projects are, you know, initiative or initiatives are going on at Brandeis now or happen during your time at Brandeis. You know, what have you been in charge with or helped with? And then what are the hot buttons at Brandeis in terms of trends with technology in teaching and learning and so forth? And what what which if there are trends, which are your interest in? And let me add to that. Um, if you had a job opening at Brandeis, what exciting things would you be um, advertising to entice people to come work there? That's another big question. <laughs> wow, yeah, I'm just taking a few notes on your questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sean and I chatted about this. Um, um, I think we both uh, agree that um, they are, if there are projects about um, assessment or you know, if we can gather, collect more data after a course um, to like conduct the evaluation, um, those are opportunities that we will feel excited about. Um, and um and and I also think if uh, we can have more collaboration with uh, campus units at the program level, that would be 
um, an opportunity to get more faculty, you know, to understand our role and what we could offer. Um, and also like for faculty buy-in, uh, which is always a challenge as a new designer. Um, I think if we, if we can work with them at program level, that would be like a really good opportunity. Um, yeah, you know, so just to background, right? Brandeis mm -hmm. is a traditional face-to-face -face campus. Yeah. Uh, um, they're not that innovative around what we do, but I can mention some of the things and try to answer these questions quickly. Um, in the time I've been there, the most interesting thing that they haven't done before was a Jewish leadership blended program and uh, MBA, so a blended program, which got put mm -hmm. on hold because they needed to do more knock market analysis. Uh, so the, the hope is that I think for, for Renee and I is that the Center for Teaching and Learning will open up these opportunities, you know, blend our style of working with faculty with uh, other programs. Um, the trends are, I think the whole world is going to be more blended. I think Brandeis will be. There are more fully online courses now. Um, we were just asked, we do the summer, they, they have the summer school. We usually do two or three courses. They have asked us to do 10 just now. Um, so there's some of that happening, but they really, you know, try to pride themselves on the face to face. I think they're going to go through some growing pains around the edges. Um, the job opening, oh, the hot button issues, I, you know, AI, like everyone else, I mean, that's been a big deal just in the last week. They've kind of gone crazy with that and probably on the fear side of the equation more than the excitement side. Uh, and a job opening, like how we might sell the position. I think, you know, when Renee came in, I just said, there's a lot of questions here. Anything could possibly happen, but we have a great team. We collaborate We're really open and, and, and about that. But in the future looks you know, like it could be really expanded. You can get a choice of doing some interesting projects that might cross over into faculty development. So if you enjoy helping people learn, faculty learn is a challenge, right? It's a different challenge than doing design, but teaching design, which can be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Mm. Can I add that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now John mentioned uh, faculty development. That's something I didn't have the training as an ISD student. Um, I got to introduce the idea at IUPUI uh, because my internship was um, managed under faculty development. So um, that's something I think if you are interested in faculty de development, there are models, approaches, um, then understanding that would you would know better uh, what approach would fit would work better for the context you are interested or you are working for. Since you mentioned IUPUI, and we're connected here in Bloomington to IUPUI campus, were there trends and hot buttons at IUPUI that you saw in the medical school while you were there? Mm, I think uh, one thing that's uh, a challenge for the instructor and which I think it's something they wanted to pursue was um, how to get student to be, how to engage student in the actual course material other than the third party uh, material, which are the medical students are crazy about the um, third party because they have a lot of exam and those materials seem to better uh, prepare them for the exams, like high stake one. So they have been um, using that instead of the the uh, course material the instructor share, and that worry the professor because they worry about their presence in the student's learning world. So that's something people ha always have um, in their mind and then how to reduce that and how to improve the other way around. And by the way, since you left mm -hmm. IUPUI, it's got mm -hmm. a new name. It's got a new name. It's Indiana, oh. Indiana University at Indianapolis. So, oh yeah. I, yeah, I heard that right before I left. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they kicked Purdue out, so there is so yeah. going to be a separate Purdue side and Indiana University side. Yeah. You know, uh, Bo knows, Bo knows, Bo knows everything according to the commercial. You know, so yeah. uh, <laughs> right, one last question. I see one question in Padlet already. Please put your questions in Padlet if you have them. Think about yourself, um, um, John and Renee. What if you were to say, what are some professional development opportunities or needs? for yourself over the next couple of years that you're going to be looking towards getting, what are things that you would sign up for or take uh, or have maybe signed up for the future? What, what are some things that you need to know in retrospect or would want to know? Mm. And I just mentioned, I put it in the um, chat, but I remembered Kurt, an important trend that I noticed like over a year ago during COVID that 
a lot of talk about more low stakes assessments since the COVID experience, which I think is great and you know helps us because we can help them redesign and and deal with that you know additional formative feedback that might be needed. But Lene, you want to go first or? Mm -hmm. uh, before she does, I'll just add to your talk about blended. Uh, I did the handbook of blended learning real thick bugger about uh, two, about 15, 16, 17 years ago. And blended learning was something that was coming in and people talk about it, and then, it, then we didn't hear it and then yeah. it was coming in then we wouldn't hear it. Kind of like eBooks. Yeah. But eBooks e hit a tipping point in 2009, 10, right around there. And I think blended learning has now hit the tipping point. So you have to, because of COVID, you yeah, can't okay. ignore blended anymore or my we have a former student uh, who developed high high flex the high flex hmm. model hmm. Uh, his name is brian Beatty. so i just just emailed him right before this class um yeah the the, the high flex or blended or what mixed model whatever you want to call it it's going to be impacting brandeis it's going to be impacting indian university all universities will be impacted by this kind of this balance between you know, online components and a face-to-face -face components and how you mix or blend them together um, thoughtfully is, is really important. Um, so, and I got an email from state of Indiana today asking if, you know, would I like put it through a proposal to train teachers on blended learning? I, uh -huh. you know, do a series of workshops oh, out of the blue. Um, I'm not going to, I, I seriously don't, unless I get a, unless um, Christian signs up to be a compadre on this and, and we go off through running around the state and, and take a vehicle driving up and down Indiana. I don't think I'll do it. Maybe <laughs> we'll pick up Bo on the way. Um, but, um, and Brandon's down here, but he'll join us. But um, so what trainings do you, you all need? What do you think? <sighs> My... I think my teaching experience has helped me a lot in uh, understanding what the instructor is going through when they are uh, when they teach a course. Um, but my experience was mainly in face to face class, uh, and then we integrated technology tool. Um, so it's not exactly um, an online course or like a really blended one. So I personally wanted to know um, how to. Like when an instructor teaching online course, the class man class management for an online course or a blended, highly blended one. Um, like how do I help them um when they come to me with a challenge or an issue happen in their class? Um, like how how to manage different kind of um formats of different kinds of courses. Um yeah, and faculty faculty development, the model and approaches are something I wanted to learn more about too. Okay, okay, that makes sense. John, it's a t that's a tough question for me. I mean, I generally go mm -hmm. after I do my I'm sort of autodidactic. I don't go to conferences anymore and all that. But I think that my interests, you know, I can say what I think is practical where I am now. But my interests are in. You know, sort of, I think learning analytics has got to break soon with some of these schools where they're really mm -hmm. afraid of it at Brandeis. Um, assessment and measurement, I'm hoping. Um, I'm interested in network learning. I don't know much about it, but I'm, I'm interested in just like faculty networks, how they're kind of hidden and we've got to sort of ferret them out in order to serve them. And But right now, uh, I'm working with someone who's got uh, just a ton of experience facilitating like on-campus faculty. And right now, that's probably the thing I'm learning just by working with this person. Like, what is the language, for example, that you use with faculty that would resonate with them when they're not doing any online, for example, you know? And so I'm going to pull up the Padlet here and say, who's ever got this question, go ahead and ask it. <laughs> was it Bo's question or whose was this? Um, that, that was me. Sorry, I was I was typing another one as you asked that there. Yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, my John, I think you you started to answer it a little bit in the chat window. Yeah. But my, uh, my wife actually does have uh, an instructional design uh, interview coming up uh. Uh, later on this week at Purdue. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but. That being said, uh, she's she's been a classroom teacher for um, a little, I think about 15, 16 years, something like that. Um, what uh, what advice would you give um, to her as she's getting ready for this interview um, and just thinking through the, um, I, I guess, the the opportunity to transition out of the classroom into an ID job? Yeah, um, I'll just say something quickly, because we interviewed a few people like a first track and one person had 20 years experience. She had a 
PhD in biochemistry or something. And I was really shocked when we talked to her because, you know, if you just sort of uh, Google or GPT chat, you know, what are the questions you get in an interview or a, a higher ed ID job? You'll probably get questions, right? You can practice. But she didn't, she really made a mistake where she was, when she talked about what she was excited about, or what she liked about her work, she didn't veer towards like knowing that this is a coaching job, which we explained, right? That you're mm -hmm. teaching someone else. It's not about what you're doing. So talking about what you're building or you're creating isn't the best answer. It's about how you engage other folks in doing so, right? So that that was my main takeaway uh, from, from from dealing with some um, K through twelve teachers. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's quite different. But I asked her, "Did you work with other faculty? Did you help them? You know, and so forth, and try to get her to go in that direction." Well, Renee might try and answer it because she's been successful interviewing in a lot of places. What's made you successful in getting jobs, Renee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> having having good advisors no <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely like the, the best thing to start with um for uh, i don't know if i can really give <laughs> good advice on this one um since she is already interviewing for the job i believe they they are interested and that's why they they invite her um i i i think um I think um, bringing in examples um, from their experience would help people visualize um, your value. So if, I think values can be kind of invisible, but when you bring in examples, it kind of help, help people think about what you can um, benefit, what you can contribute to their context. So I think I I try to always think of example whenever. Um, I say I can do this, then I think of a past project, which project gave me this uh, qualification to say I, I can do this. Gotcha. Yeah. That's a good answer, Renee. When my World is Open book came out and I, I had a publicist get me interviews on, on radio shows, I had a list of all these examples from the book. And then when people asked me, because I was, I was talking examples and people love examples, they have stories. They love to concretize what's going on. And, and so it, once you pull an example up, you can elaborate on it. You just need the, you just need a, you know, the start of a story, the start of the example, and then you, then you're, you become fluent and it shows that you've been doing things, right? Those examples become your, you know, your dossier, you know, of, of who you are as an instructional designer or consultant or whatever titles you, and responsibilities you have. But I think Bo has a second question, Bo, you have, but you want to go ahead with your second one? Yeah, sorry. Um, so I was just thinking uh, as you guys were just discussing, you know, the just I guess the the collaborative work that you do with with professors in these roles. And I was just wondering, is, is has there ever been a a course uh, or a module or anything like that that has been particularly challenging to design for? Um, maybe something that's a little out of the norm. Um, if so, what was it, and why was it so uh, so so different or unique? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was thinking there's got to be something. I have to remember it. <laughs> um, challenge, you mean challenging in terms of, um, like in terms of the content or, or, uh, possibly the content. Mm -hmm. It could be, but maybe it was mm -hmm. just something that didn't fit into your traditional course structure that you um mm -hmm. might have found a, as a as a difficulty. And, and another challenge could be it's outside your cost structure. You can't afford to build what mm -hmm. they want to build. That's true too. Mm -mm. I think so far at Brandeis, um, I think we had a project that had a very tight uh, timeline. So uh, time constraint can be one thing. So first we, we, tr we always try to understand the desired goal of the instructor, but then when you really consider the, whether or not the goal is realistic, given the time frame, then um, you kind of have to adjust and then also maybe persuade them to adjust uh, so everything can be done within the time frame. Um, so that can be one challenge. Um, and I think another challenge I had with the IUPUI internship was, um, it, it was sometimes the instructor, maybe the professor didn't actually know what they wanted to do to, to improve. And yeah. I think even though we try to give options and then they prototype so they they could see it before they decided which option they wanted to go i think in the process when people were doing things 
they maybe have different ideas occurred and so they wanted to change again or change back or so that process can be challenging especially I was working as a grad student um under like a doctor physician so I feel that the power dynamic can also make the communication um challenging like to to make it hard to to manage like you have to really think about how to how to help them achieve their goal Renee what does a um a typical timeline actually look like for for a course development mm, at Brandeis yeah. um Zhang maybe know more about the detail I think oh, the timeline general, um we, we like one. to have like three to three or even four months to work with the faculty over time um gotcha. a lot of that can be taken up by things that aren't course design but uh, you know we try to have at least nine weeks of direct work so you can think about like teaching the course is three to four months you kind of need to double the time like it's yeah. like another three or four months to design one we, we don't do a lot of uh, there's not a lot of money behind things like you know fancy multimedia or things like that but places like northeastern that has a big program i think they take more like six to nine months because they do that piece and they have to have more people involved so as it gets more complex, it goes on. I don't know if you want me to answer this, but the one thing I can say that might be useful about the challenge is usually it is the person you're working with that becomes the biggest challenge if that does. But I could say for myself, when I came to RAB, they have really highly technical content. They have um, robotic software engineering. They have other software type things. They have uh, data data related things. Um, so I tried to look what, what I found helpful and I've done in the past since I started this field is if I'm running into something like, how do you teach computer science at a certain level to people? I go to look at the research about teaching computer science, which does exist. Like there's a, the first 2019 research handbook came out for computer science. So you can actually kind of check out, well, what is the state of the art for teaching computer science? Because this is hard to understand some of this content for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So I'll go back to the previous question about examples. Um, for those of you who are going to interview for a job, mm -hmm. if it's on Zoom, you could. What I did for my interviews on the radio, when there were uh, uh, when I was re, uh, phone phone interviews on radio, I'd have a sheet of paper with all sorts of things written all over the place. Where each one was a different example I could use, and I have it just sitting there. Under, they wouldn't see this, so I have all these examples written down. I could use them then. Now my handwriting's awful. And I'm very sloppy. I write all over the place. So it wasn't as easy as it sounds, you know, but it was a big help. Boost it boosts your confidence and that you'll know that there's something that way and you 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 have a cheat sheet kind of at your side to answer these these difficult, difficult questions when you put on the spot. Um, let me say you know, radio is a lot of fun, but you know, just like any interview, you get your questions that come up that are difficult ones. Um, so uh let's go to back to oh let me. Anyone else have a question besides um, Bo? Who else would like to jump in here? We've got a lot of people here today. So we've got Brandon's here and I think Mika's you know, here. While, while we're waiting, I can say when I did have a portfolio, which I kind of used to for higher ed, I would put case studies that sort of included his, the faculty person I was working with and how I dealt with the challenges around that faculty member, which is different than maybe a traditional <laughs> portfolio, right? For instructional design, it's important. I mean, it's probably the toughest part of our job. Christian, let's go back to your sheet until someone jumps in. What what else you have, Christian? I have a question. Go ahead. Sorry, my microphone may not be the best right now. Uh, it's really just asking for a resource. Do you by chance the Brandeis have like a faculty toolkit? uh accessible online if it's public so you can share the url with us do you have a faculty toolkit at brandeis and is it shareable if you have one <laughs> sorry um the, the 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 ctl is just getting getting the website together i think um renee you know the quickest way to maybe send them to our website but we're trying to begin we're doing it now putting together some uh, some more uh, interesting or content for faculty to get access to but i don't think we have a lot out there yeah um uh, john do you want me to share my screen and i can sure, sure. Go right ahead. um so so this is our the website we are um trying to put more um project showcase things we have uh, been working on but this is a list of the services the center offers 
Um, so I, and you can kind of see, sorry, Renee, but you can see pedagogical partnerships, faculty learning communities. This is all what's listed below there is traditional mm -hmm. faculty development grants to support teaching, which we have gotten involved with one on one consultations. This is the other side. Like now you see course design institutes. That's something where we could really blend our expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very much pointed towards what the person is putting this together, who is a faculty development person, used to mm -hmm. work at the Box Center at Harvard, for example, right? Yeah, so. But we'd like to give them some real examples of instructional design, you know, learning design, mm -hmm. instructional technology integration. Do you say the Box Center at Harvard? Is that? Yeah. What, what is that? I don't, I... Uh, it's it's kind of like this big sort of center for teaching and learning, but it's, um, I, I don't know um, exactly how they're um, distributed, but he was sort of in the science teaching part of things. So he worked in that way that we are working with face-to-face -face instructors all the time. And, you, you know, you give workshops like how to engage your students, right? Or, I don't know. But we haven't blended our approaches yet. Okay. I was, I was thinking you meant the box, the, the tool, because oh. yesterday I was chatting with a former student who's now VP at Box and will be a guest I've, I've, at the end of the semester. So we're going to bring the vice president of Box from the UK. Uh -uh. Um, she lives next to Stonehenge. She's a very interesting person. I have visited her and she's <laughs> been a guest a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. She was at Mo she was at Vodafone, she was at Motorola and a couple other companies, and she's real interesting. So um other questions from any of the students here? Nicholas. Did I see you have a question? I put the link to the box center, by the way, in the uh, chat. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Anyone want to jump in? I have a few more I can ask. Uh, Amelia, you have anything from Japan to jump, at least jump in and say hi from Japan. Hi. Hi there. Uh, no, hi. actually, the questions that popped into my mind have all been answered. So oh. thank you. I guess the one thing that um, kind of these talks are always real inspiring and I learn a lot. But what is like one real common mistake uh, people make when they put their courses online that you see a, a lot of, I guess? What's the, uh, the worst case scenario on that? Huh. Mm, I, I think um, one thing is, I think instructor don't always think about their audience, um, their audience as their students. Um, so they are thinking more about the content they want to teach instead of how the student would receive the content, I guess. So, so that can cause a lot of problems around the course design and how they sequence uh, the content. Yeah, and I, Millie, I tend to think it's almost the same thing they do in face-to-face. -face. They, they try to cover too much content and they're not, this is definitely true, they, they're not clear and specific enough in the language and it costs them a lot of emails, you know, the, uh, and if they're working with a designer, they usually avoid that. But when, I, when I've seen people not work with designers, the course looks like, like there'll be, instead of a, a chronological thing where you have a week and then you have the way students would experience that week, they have folders of, here's my assignments, here's my test. And I can never figure that out because in a face-to-face -face class, you don't come to the first class with a big folder of all your assignments and all your tests and just dump it on the student's desk. But they do that online when they don't work with designers all the time. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. And I, I do feel Thanks. like I, I, may, I may be called out on that. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we all have suffered from you know, some of the, these issues. And so we all learn from each iteration of a course, right? And For sure. So, yeah. Uh, Jennifer, anything from Texas you want to bring up from Texas Community College or Dallas Community College? Um, no, um, y'all have hit a lot of the things that I would have asked about, but I guess I'm curious when you're doing your consultations, is that happening in person or do you do a lot of that over Zoom now or? How does that work? Renee, you want to start? Yeah. I can start. <laughs> um, it it's, has been always uh, online for my all my experiences. Yeah. Yeah, and Jennifer, I worked at a community college for five years. I, mm -hmm. What I found there was that you had to have play more roles, right, with a small team. But um, mm -hmm. 
in Brandeis, it's been online, but in past jobs, it's been a mix, mostly face-to-face -face probably, or even a phone call at some point in the past. We haven't heard from Nick. You have anything to add? Uh, no, not much, but from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you're having a lot of conversations with um, faculty. And I guess, is are there any insights about that you've gained about maybe what's helped you with reaching the faculty? The faculty you're talking to and helping them commit to you know think make taking steps to reach their goals mm. i'm sorry if, if it's already been addressed my dog no, no, no. growing up in the other room and so i had to go deal with that for a second and then um, just came back. yeah and renee whatever we can go first i i don't know if the question though i'll just say and stop is if it's about persuading faculty towards a certain direction which is a lot of what we tend to think about at some point yeah. or something else but renee um you want to go first or you want me to um i i would say um like understanding their goal and understanding how much resource we have like how how like um how much time we have um um what their experience past experience was with um probably help us with the buy-in process or to initiate uh, the collaboration more successfully. Okay. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, basically just making sure that like hearing from them what their background experiences and stuff to bring that to play in it. Yeah, and that help with yeah. building trust as well, which I think is really important for uh, working yeah. with faculty. And, and Nicholas, I'll just mention a few things. I noticed Renee too is really good at this particular thing, like listening to faculty and let them, they're always passionate about their content. And if you let them express that in the first meetings or so, they'll talk to you about other things, right? But mm. then there's this persuasion, trying to move someone away from their pedagogy towards something more, uh, maybe more you know, progressive or effective, um, just requires not pushing, like sort of acting like, I don't really care what you do, here's where we'll go. but. One of those things is like, I think marketing people think about this more than us, but things like mm -hmm. affiliation, right? So I know I do this all the time. Like I know a faculty member who teaches what you teach and they're as local as I can find, right, Nicholas? They're either working here or at a nearby institution or a like institution. And here's something they do that I've been thinking about in my background that would be helpful for your content and course. And take a look, what do you think? And, and they feel this sense of affiliation and excellence. And there's a bunch of things like that marketing people think of, it's not bad for us, but we also have their best interests in mind, hopefully, right? So we're not just trying to sell them a bullshit idea, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Chu Ying, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any comments or any questions? Not yet. I'm still listening. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a new question I'm going to end with, but we have a couple other I have before we end with my um, both of you. I had on the list a question about collaboration. So um, I'm curious from Renee's standpoint, when you're working with faculty, um, what do you consider uh, in terms of collaborating with, what, what considerations do you have to think about in terms of collaboration? Are you working in a team or are you working one-to-one -one with people? And how does that how does that unfold? And has that changed from the jobs that you had both in Bloomington and Indianapolis? Have, has no, have notions of collaboration changed along the way? And for John, um, what team collaboration if any, happens there at Brandeis when, when your folks develop instruction uh, and how do you collaborate with other people who might be working and reporting to you? Or what is your role in that? So either okay. either of you, um, maybe start with, since I asked Renee first, mm -hmm. Renee, you have any reflections on the evolution of collaboration over the last three um, jobs and what it, what it currently looks like? Mm, I, I that's a really good question. Uh, I haven't thought about too much. Uh, um, well, your dissertation's on collaboration. Come on. Uh, I mean, the, the transition um, between <laughs> my different. <laughs> my That's different, writing uh, collaboration of ESL. It's much different. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I actually think like with John and our team, uh, we have had really good uh, collaboration. Uh, among our team member and with faculty, mainly I think because our role was defined, I think relatively clear. So that make the whole process easier. Um, someone is the lead in, uh, designer and then uh, to work with the instructor. And I also have um, observed participated in a few uh, projects John was leading. 
um, and learning from the process. But my past experience uh, at IUPUI, sometimes we have two um, designers on one team. So that can make it challenging to like who does which part. And we have the same role. Um, and that's why it was uh, not always easy to um, decide on the job or the work um, work divide the work division. And if you have different opinions, then you have to communicate more. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say like right now our team collaboration is um, like role clearly defined um, and we have worked really well with each other I, from my, my point of view. So yep, that's good. Uh, uh, Derek Bach from Harvard, not Vox uh, or Bach, okay, Bach. Derek yeah. Bach. <laughs> I've used his quotes all the time in my R546 course on instructional strategies. He was one of the few presidents of the university who truly cared about teaching and learning. Yeah. So I recommend to any of my students, if there's anything by Derek Bach, he's, it's worth mm -hmm. reading. Uh, even just a short article, it gives you a really insightful ideas on how to teach for active in an active, engaging environment. So John, sure. do you have any thoughts about collaboration? Uh, yeah, so I'll try to cover like the different people we might work with. Like with LDs, I think for the most part, we we work independently and we consult with each other, right? And what usually happens is when you need a consultation with someone, it's not like when the meeting happens. So you might have to, you know, hit them on Slack or something and say, hey, I've got this thing I'm wondering about. Um, with Renee and I being, you know, her being new, it was, it was kind of fun because we got to work together on a, a project through, throughout and and some of the after a time i would start the project and she would take over and that was kind of nice and that's kind of you don't always get the time to collaborate because you're working on a project independently a lot of the time with course designs um with the faculty developer is my boss is a faculty developer and he runs sort of the center for teaching and learning i actually just worked with him on a feedback workshop for the writing instructors and i was the subject matter expert and but he knew about faculty development more than i did so that was an interesting sort of combination of like almost Almost me being a SME and him being, you know, more expert working faculty. And occasionally we've worked with instructional technologists when they know more about a tool and we can bring them in on using a tool for a particular type of pedagogical intervention. That's that's a rare, but uh, at this school, but it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, I could see that happening. Um, any, I have one more for each of you. Any more student questions? Um, both seems uh, to be. Dr. Yeah, go ahead. Can I add one thing? I just share a link about an interview method that is really popular if you are interviewing for a corporate job. I, I don't think higher ed really uh, prefer this method, but uh, the STAR method, I just sent a link in the chat uh, for Bo, and that was that's really a po really popular method. A lot of the interview interviewers, they are expecting you to answer the question based on this method. So I actually also practice with this method when I uh, interview for the Brandeis job, but I, I think it was more for a corporate um corporate position id position yeah thank you renee um anyone else want to jump in here before our guests have to leave okay. i'm just throwing a few resources in there if anyone wants to look at uh, some of these links i missed the link sorry so uh, mr christian had his hand up i think yeah um, I have lots of questions, but since this week's discussion is about behavioral learning theory, um, <laughs> for both of you, how have, has behavioral, behavioral learning theory influenced your personal design methodology? Oh, wow, that's a, <laughs> a tough that question. My, very last question. You stole that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and while, while, they're, while, while they're thinking of an answer, um, they put up, John put up ed tech books. The owners or the creators of EdTech Books will be our guests in here in a couple of weeks. So we will have, hear from EdTech oh, cool. Books. So uh, we'll hear well, uh, from Jason McDonald and Richard West, who are two of the, the key people in EdTech Free Books. Thank you, John, for, for putting that up there. <laughs> oh, yeah, some good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So first, he's promoting our Authentic Learning Week in two weeks, and now the EdTech Books Week. <laughs> which is uh, two weeks after that. So um, so either one of you to a behaviorist out there, a behaviorist at heart, or <laughs> use behaviorist principles. You know, or, uh, or if you uh, don't at all, if you see it in other people's designs that oops, you have to help that. them through. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, 
I, I don't know if we use that um, anymore, but um, I think um, it's good to, if the faculty has um, difficult experience with say grading, and if they try to design a course or a rubric that would got them into a difficult grading situation, say you know, time consuming or it's not efficient, then I think that maybe you would remind them <laughs> like that might be time consuming or it's not re really reaching their goal. So they think of their past experience. I don't know if that counts as behaviorism, but yeah, like so they can avoid that. <laughs> I don't know if this is behaviorism, but I've become interested in, um, you know, how to change people's behavior and 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 and, and it's like faculty and using persuasion, the right kind of techniques that also are ethical, right? And it seems like the healthcare folks know how to do this, marketing people know how to do this, and we can kind of borrow from where they are. Um, so I just put that link in the nudge. So I thought, well, this is maybe a, I don't know, this sounds like behaviorism, but I'm not sure. <laughs> It probably it's maybe is a little bit more like mastery or gu guided mastery or something. Is what it's. I mean, mm. it depends on what. So, like stimulus response is usually the behavioral yeah. method. Yeah, know, but the, mastery uh, learning comes out of the behavioral camp. Um, mm -hmm. Guided comes out of the constructivist camp. So it's kind of a, a, you know, the guy who hired me in my first job at, in academia at West Virginia said he's a. Uh, Rogerian Skinnerian, a humanist behaviorist, you know, uh, and that's <laughs> that's the way it is. Um, so my final questions for each of you, I'll give two, two totally different questions. So I'm going to just ask them and, and then I'll let John think of it and I'll have Renee go first. So Renee, mm -hmm. the question I'm going to ask you or will ask you now, um, why don't you think about your graduate training here at IU and how you can help the students out in, what, in terms of course selection that they have coming up. So mm -hmm. what aspects of the courses that you or experiences that you you had uh, in your graduate work um, have been most influential on you in terms of what mm -hmm. you're doing now in the work world? And John, I'm mm -hmm. curious uh, about what you see as the the upcoming road that instructional designers will you know face the paths they face the upcoming challenges in the development of instruction. How will how will an instructional designer role or um, um, educational technologist role in in a teaching and learning center maybe change in the coming year. It's already changed a lot. <laughs> it's, yeah. con it's continuing to go through our dramatic changes actually. And there are tons of jobs today compared to 10 or 20 years ago when you were first getting in. Um, now it's just, you know, the thousands and thousands of jobs, but they're different. They're different than what they were. So I'll let you think about that. And Renee, yeah. tell, tell them what, what, Maybe recommend a, a certain course or, you know, whatever, <laughs> or, or so, a book or something. Yeah. So Dr. Funk's uh, 546 was my first IEC course. Um, and I still remember we try a lot of teaching strategies in that class. So we experienced the strategy as a student. And I was teaching language courses at that time. Uh, and language classes tend to have a lot of activity. So I think experience something before you coach or teach someone else to do something has been really helpful to me. So um, so that's why I think like the course I we did the uh, teaching strategy, we play the with the the activity in the course and then I try that uh, when I was teaching. And right now um, with the faculty, I think I also use a lot of my teaching experiences um, when I guide them in a course design. So I think experience something um, before you do it is um, important. Um, and, oh. and then my coursework, so that one was my first one and it really helped me to apply what I uh, learned to what I'm teaching. And then 521, the, the development, the development uh, of the instructional and performance, that one is, is very useful. Um, the evaluation course um, and then the uh, analysis, those two uh, were also really helpful um, for my, like among my coursework. That's 561 and 521. 561 and uh, 621. Oh, and 621. Yeah. Okay. 621, okay. 621 um, was uh, needs analysis. Right. And 561 mm -hmm. was evaluation. Right, right. Yeah. So 
the 546 you mentioned of mine, I'll try and offer next fall. It used to be on Saturdays, but since I'll do it online, you know, it's it's I'll I'll have sessions like this on Saturday mornings. They'll be taped and optional to come to. Um, Christian and Bo took it last year, uh, and so we had that. Um, and we have a, someone coming in uh, at the end of this session. So welcome in Nader, who's coming in. Welcome Nader, um, and John, the uh, final. Um, yeah, and Kurt, you said uh, I know you. I remember the part about how LD will change in CTLs. Was there something previous to that, though? Sorry. Another yeah, piece. Well, the, you know, the jobs of instructional designers are in constant um, change, you know, and uh, yeah. how, how do you see this, the skill base changing maybe in the, in the near future? Well, yeah, you know, that that la that part you just said, I just heard, who's the uh, academic who was the connective, connectionism person up in uh, well, Canada? There's two of them. That's Stephen Downs is up ah, in Canada. And yeah. then George Siemens was in Canada. He's down in. Right, uh, right. In thank Texas. you. So yeah. I heard Downs the other, uh, not long ago, like a week or so ago, maybe yeah. on a podcast and he, <laughs> the, the person interviewing me said, well, what will happen? You know, we were talking all about the futures and um, AI and he said, you know, technology. He said, well, what will happen? The interviewer said, what will happen to instructional design jobs? He goes, oh, they'll be gone. <laughs> I was like, whoa, wait a minute. But um, so I don't know, you know, he's more of an expert than I am. But the way LD and CTLs, you know, so learning designers don't always work in a CTL. I don't know how unusual it is, but it's kind of sprinkled. We're all over the university. We just happen to be in a CTL. I would say that I look at Europe sometimes for the future. The best research I've seen usually comes out of you know, the most for distance learning and this sort of thing comes out of Europe, Australia, uh, things like that. And when you look at, like, for example, the University of Maastricht uh, in the Netherlands has a business school, which when I look at their CTL, is like, that's how I'd like to work. You know, each person had their series of specialties, which really blended a little more our field with faculty development, which I think they can learn a lot from us and we can learn a lot from them. Um, but right now we're very different worlds. I mean, I've done some research on this on CTLs and you never see, I look at a 400 page document that was the uh, program for the biggest faculty development uh, conference in the world. And it was almost not mentioned at all, what learning design or instructional design or anything. So we're very separate still, and that shouldn't be, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Stephen Downs is pretty well known. He has a blog. Um, it's D-O-W-N-E-S. It's Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Uh, he's in New Brunswick um, and works for a government center there. And he's been around for a while. He used to blog every day on the news in the, in the field of ed tech or IST or whatever you call it. And you could just read his blog and get updated when what, what things were happening. He does a marvelous job of that. And he has a couple of papers on the future of education, the future of instructional design. That's probably why he was on the podcast show because he's written about it. And so, um, but he's a kind of a curmudgeon a little bit. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, you, you don't want to get on his bad side, but he's a friend of mine. And, um, but he, he can hold his own in any um, academic um, debates. Let's just put it that way. I met him the day that Al Gore won and then he lost. So um, I was in Canada. I had the absentee ballot cost about three or four hundred dollars to absentee ballot that day. But um, but I predicted that it would come down to Florida to everybody at our symposium. And it did come down to Florida that day. And my one prediction of life that came true. But Stephen was the presenter after me. I was in Canada in um, Toronto at that talk. And the famous people who kind of ran the conference by the name of Carl Breiter and Marlene Scardamalia, who did uh, the, the writing uh, technologies, they had students present for them who were six and seven years old. Their students that they were studying did their keynote presentation. That was really cool. So after that keynote with these students, I was in my next talk with Stephen Downs. And Stephen has long hair. It's like a hippie throwback from the 60s yeah. and a long mustache. And just a really smart, smart guy. I'd never met him before, but it just is, you know, his his physique um, stood out in my mind. And and but we've been we've been friends ever since. And when I get a new book, sometimes I send it his way. And I highly he he developed connectivism as a theory and personalized learning environments. He's big on he's developed some tools to create more personalized learning environments. So, so Stephen Downs is re really um one you like David Jonathan mentioned earlier people that you should be aware of their made an impact within the field. Um, and you have readings probably from both uh, or you will within the, the time you're in the program. 
Thank you very much, John, for coming in oh, and sure. spending time. Sure. Can I mention there's another uh, guy? I'm sure you know him. He's got this long beard and he's an education futures guy in higher right. ed. He yeah, could yeah. be useful to figure out what's happening in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and his name, which which one is it? I can't remember his name. <laughs> I mean, Brian, Brian? Brian, Brian, yes. Yeah, um, now I'm blanking on Brian's last name, but um, he has his own show each week. And... Um, he's kind of a, um, Alexander, a Alexander. So Brian Alexander has a couple of books out there in the future of education, which I'll highly recommend, uh, to you all. Uh, I bought one of them and it's a quick read. I read it in the line to vote, I think a couple of years ago. <laughs> I mean, it was that quick a read, but it's really good. Uh, Brian Alexander, definitely worth reading. Um, and we're talking to, if you ever see him at a conference or a really nice guy, I've been yeah. on his show. He has a show, every free show every Thursday, uh, kind of like a, a, a talk show. They use a tool where you can have conferences within conferences. Uh, and so you can connect your image to someone else, have a private conference with them. Yeah, it's and, fun. Yeah, it's, it's a fun thing. I've been a couple of times, been a guest a couple of times. So, yeah. So thanks for mentioning that as well. Uh, let's give um, John and Renee a round of applause for coming in here and joining the nice R511 week five or whatever it is. I am going to stop the recording in a second. Um, any final things you want to get on camera <laughs> or not? Uh, I will sit stop and